Mark Golub, and in the news, the consequences of Israeli national elections held earlier this month. The big question was about Benjamin Netanyahu. Would, in essence, he win an unprecedented fifth term, meaning that he would head the next coalition government, or whether the Israeli people as a whole were ready for a change and would choose General Benny Gantz, leader of the new Blue and White Party, to become Israel's next prime minister. Often one would hear from Israelis how much they dislike Bibi and are disgusted by the charges of bribery and fraud and breach of trust, which have resulted in the Attorney General's indictments of the Prime Minister. But Israelis often end their diatribe against Mr. Netanyahu by saying he's still the best person for the job of leading Israel's economy and for keeping Israel safe from those who seek to undermine the legitimacy of the State of Israel, either by violence or by diplomacy. And this Israeli attitude seems to have still been at work in the April 9th elections, when the dust has all settled, although Netanyahu's Likud party is down one seat from last elections, it wound up with 35 seats, as did blue and white. However, a combined 29 members of the smaller parties elected this time support Netanyahu rather than Gantz, giving the Likud bloc a total of 64 seats. As a result, Israeli President Reuven Rivlin asked Mr. Netanyahu to form the next coalition government, which he is in the process of doing now. So where do things stand today? And how do Israelis feel about the results of this past election? And whom among the Israeli people does the Netanyahu coalition represent? For some answers, we turn once again to the outstanding political columnist and analyst of the Times of Israel, Chaviv Retegur. Chaviv, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark. Good to be here. Okay, Chaviv, first of all, just tell us, where do things stand as we tape today? Netanyahu is trying to lock down coalition agreements with the parties um, that would give him the, the, the easiest coalition, the coalition with the least you know, ideological diversity, which, of course, creates potential for conflict down the road. So he wants a coalition on the right. Um, he met today with uh, Kulanu chairman uh, Moshe Kachlon. Uh, he met uh, a few days ago with Israel Beitenu chairman uh, Vigdor Lieberman. Uh, and there's already been a great deal of exchange of positions with uh, the Union of Right-Wing Parties, the ultra-Orthodox parties. So we're right now at the stage of getting to sort of understand what everyone is demanding, and then he has to sort of see wh how, he, how he balances all the different demands. Of course, all the different parties are trying to get as much as they can, and he still has to deliver for his own party. Chaviv, this is my question I want to ask you. Is this a ritual dance of some kind? Bottom line, do you, do most Israelis understand where this is most likely to end up? And although we're going through all these discussions, the numbers are clear, the alignment is pretty clear. There may be some discussion about who gets what ministerial position, but by and large, this is now just a dance. Yeah, that's a good point. That you, you really point to, I think, the crux of the matter. Uh, an Israeli election is really two elections. There is the race to be prime minister between the one, two, very rarely three largest parties who are competing over who will actually be the head of government. And then there's a second race by all the smaller parties. And this all is, of course, at the same ballot box on the same election day, but it's in effect a second race. They're competing. Parties like Kulanu, Israel Beiteno, the ultra-Orthodox parties, secularist parties, Meretz on the left, they're competing to not to lead the government, because they won't, but to actually help shape the government and to get control of various agencies and policy uh, and pull them in their favor. And it's important to note that so the first race, who's going to be prime minister, that is settled. There's no chance that Netanyahu is not going to be prime minister. Of 
course, there's always some chance. These are human beings negotiating. You know, this, this could fail, but it's very hard to see it happening. It's an easier coalition to negotiate than the one that Danielle faced uh, both in 2015 and in 2013. Um, when he had to bring parts of the Labour Party into the government, and, and there were all a, lot, a lot more complexities there. Um, but the second part of the election, which smaller parties control what agency, is very significant. It is in, in, the, in the coalition agreements with these smaller parties, for example, that all questions of religion and state have, have, have almost always been subject to the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox veto. It is in this section where... There was a study of the 2015 coalition agreements that formed after the 2015 election that formed Netanyahu's fourth government, uh, in which Netanyahu uh, apparently gave away something like 9 billion shekels to specific needs and specific to the Haredi education system, settlements, various parochial interests represented by various small parties that he needed in his coalition. Nine billion shekels was something like 3% of the 2016 national budget, uh, which is a very large amount of a state national budget. So um, the election of Netanyahu is guaranteed, all but guaranteed, I mean, almost certainly, 99.9%. Uh, but there's still a lot at stake in these conversations with the smaller parties that, that shape Israeli education, Israeli culture, Israeli society, uh, religion and state, all sorts of very fundamental issues that are not necessarily what the prime minister deals with on the day-to-day basis. Okay, I, I appreciate your answer, and here's what I think I heard you say. There's no question, first of all, who's going to put the coalition government together. It's going to be Netanyahu. That means he's going to have a fifth term. After all the strum and drum, Khaviv, it turns out the Israeli people as a whole still wanted a right-leaning, right I don't know if it's a right wing, right-leaning government led by Netanyahu. Then you say, okay, so there's jockeying at the moment. Who's going to get what ministerial position? And the reason that's important is it tends to shape the notion of policy with inside this coalition. But it's not as if Meretz, which got four seats, is going to be in this coalition in any way whatsoever and therefore, it's not, let's see what merits can do to shape the coalition government. Am I correct? Right. So the, the, the Israeli voter, for you know, 30 years now, has had a very clear distinction, has shown that they distinguish between security questions, which, which is what prime ministers are elected on, and all the other um, domestic issues from the economy and healthcare and housing prices and religion and state and all of that stuff. Um, on security, so merit is just, not, that's what it means to be left wing or right wing. It's a security question. Um, so merit is not invited into a Netanyahu coalition in any, in any imaginable scenario. But, for example, in the 2013 um, government that Netanyahu led, uh, the um, Jewish Home and Yeshatid parties managed to push a much more secular and modern agenda uh, and actually leave out in the cold the ultra-Orthodox, which resulted in a law about passed in the Knesset about ultra-Orthodox uh, military service um, that was immediately overturned in the, after the 2015 election when the ultra-Orthodox then came back into the coalition. So um, there, there are... Security is not an issue. This is not suddenly... There's no chance that this is not a right-wing government when it comes to security, Iran, Palestinians. That, is, that was settled in the prime ministerial race. But um, questions of, of, of religion, questions of secularism, questions of the education system, which in Israel is a big culture war, um, those are absolutely up for grabs um, in, in this coalition negotiation process. And so Israelis are watching this, I think, more closely maybe than people overseas, because overseas... Really, the, the Iran, Palestinians, those are the significant questions that people care about. But um, most of the things that is actually affect Israelis' daily lives are being decided now in the coalition talks. Okay. Um, when we spoke before the election, we spoke about some of the forces that would or would not vote for Netanyahu, and he was facing legal issues. And again, even if he was the... You know, 
even if he was a saint, at times people say enough's enough, no matter who the uh, elected leader is. And then, lo and behold, the way the election went, once again, Netanyahu is going to be prime minister. What I didn't ask you then, and I want to ask you now, is to what extent does this election reflect a division between the Ashkenazi Israeli community and the Sephardi community? To what extent is, this, is there a cultural gap reflected in this election? And is there any greater preponderance of voting for Netanyahu from Mizrahi Jews, those who've come from Arab countries in the Middle East, as opposed to the Ashkenazim who came in with the initial waves of immigration at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. To what extent is there a Mizrahi Ashkenazi revelation here? Um, so that's a, that, that opens up sort of a very complicated issue. On the one hand, there is a clear divide. Uh, blue and white, one um, Ashkenazi majority areas, most Ashkenazi majority areas, and Likud won most Shafardi majority areas. So that, that is a deep fundamental truth. It has been true in Israeli politics roughly since 19, mid, the mid-1970s, um, and, uh, and, and it's important to, to understand that. Um, the, you know, it's sometimes um, viewed overseas, they, uh, people often, mostly non-Jews, maybe not your viewers uh, or my readers, but um, many, many foreign observers think that Israelis are sort of European and white and, um, and uh, like Netanyahu, and, uh, and the Arabs are brown. In fact, in Israel, the, the Jews who come from the Muslim world, the Jews who come from the Arab world, the Jews with a darker skin, uh, tend to be the right-wing Jews, um, and and that is that, that that has some profound implications and comes from a very significant historical difference between Ashkenazim and Mizrahi in Israel. Having said that, um, Mizrahi and Sephardi identity is also um, starting to to fade, and it's starting to fade largely because of intermarriage. Um, very few Jews today living, not very few, but a majority of Jews living today in Israel uh, are a mix of various, you know, uh, various uh, immigration waves from various countries. Yes. They're half Algerian, a quarter Polish, etc. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so the, the identities are fading, but, but they're still clinging on um, uh, when it comes to voting. And uh, it's not entirely clear why that's happening. I suspect it's got more to do with um, with uh, the fact that there's still a very huge, a very significant wage gap. It's, 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 uh, it's a gap in, in economic status and it's a gap in education um, that still affects how, how, uh, how they vote. One really interesting point about that, in this election, Blue and White and Likud did not argue about policy. There was no real difference in the mm -hmm. policy that the two parties proposed. Mm -hmm. And Ashkenazim still favored blue and white, and parties still favored Likud. So these are not policy differences so much as some sort of, um, some sort of a long-term um, um, identity that is, that, is, that is resilient even as, as Israelis are becoming a more you know, ethnic mutt, so to speak. I understand. They're becoming more mixed. I understand. By the way, at the moment, Khabib, is, are there more Israelis who are Mizrahi or more Israelis who are Ashkenazi? It's almost exactly half and half. Okay. Uh, you know, the Times of Israel, uh, your, your news organization, did an interesting piece on 10 things we can learn from the voting patterns in this election. One of them was that the cities where Likud earned its highest percentage were significantly poorer than strongholds of blue and white. Do you feel that again, and you sort of referred to this a moment ago, all the issues when it comes to Palestinians and Iran, it seems to me left and right has more relevance in the United States and among American Jews than it does among Israelis. There seems to be basic consensus 
within Israel on those issues, and you've talked about that. But the economy is where people ultimately have different views. And do you feel there is here, in some way, a class distinction between Likud and blue and white, where blue and white had a more affluent base, and that Netanyahu and the Likud party and the those, again, the, the parties that are associated with the right are representing more blue-collar, the average worker, the poorer Israeli on the Israeli scene. I think it goes back to, um, to a, um, a, a really one of Israel's original sins. In, Israel was founded in 1948. By 1952, the population of Israel more than doubled. It doubled in three, four years because hundreds of thousands, probably somewhere around 800,000 uh, Jews from the Arab world uh, fled the Arab world to Israel. And, um, and these Jews were settled by the government, by the Ashkenazi-dominated government of Israel in these poor desert periphery towns where they were then neglected for the next several decades and there was actually a policy in the 40s and 50s of the ruling Mapai party um, to try and keep them out of the, of, the, of the party itself, of the party organization. They were seen by some of the Israeli Ashkenazi elite as uh, less uh, educated. This was essentially sort of middle of the 20th century European, uh, uh, European you know, bigotry um, uh, projected onto the Israeli political scene. In, in how Jews interacted with other Jews. And, uh, and that created a deep, deep abiding sense of, you know, an Ashkenazi elite that is, that is marginalizing um, the Mizrahi uh, half of Israel. Now, that's no longer the case, right? We now have regularly, you know, chiefs of staff of the IDF who were born in, 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 in places like uh, uh, Persia or you know, like Iran or, or, or Iraq or places like that. We now have politicians that are from all over the world. We, we've had a Mizrahi president. It's no longer the case that Mizrahim are marginalized in that way. But it's a little bit like race in America. It doesn't make sense that it should suddenly evaporate after generations and generations and generations of, of, of being a sort of fundamental truth of, of, of society. Um, and, so, uh, and so, yeah, there is a... Uh, Mizrahim who vote Likud um, often face the accusation that they're voting against their own economic interests, it's because Likud is a party under Netanyahu, certainly, um, that advocates free market, you know, capitalism, uh, uh, economic liberalism, and, uh, and they're the poor. They're the most reliant on the Israeli welfare state. And yet they vote Likud. And they vote Likud out of a sense of identity and out of the continuing echoes of the rebellion against the, against the Mapai elite, the Ashkenazi Jewish elite uh, of the 1940s through 70s. Um, and, and that's something that has, has, has had a lot of sticking power. Um, and I think the second piece of, of their vote is also uh, their sense that uh, the Arab world is a very dangerous place, right? The, the, the grandparents of the Israeli voters who fled the Arab world, are still alive, by and yes. large. And, and they, they remember, the, it's a lived memory of being refugees fleeing the Arab world, what the Yazidis or the Kurds experienced uh, in more recent times and in the news, uh, these people still remember. So there's also a hawkishness in the Mizrahi community that Ashkenazi Jews don't, don't share because it's not their personal family experience. So these two factors, I think, keep the Mizrahi vote uh, on the Likud side, um, and uh, and that's something we saw in this election uh, continuing. Okay, fascinating. We should remind our viewers it was the Isra Mizrahi community which helped elect a Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and his surprise victory over Labour was in part driven by the um, Mizrahi community. I want to ask you quickly, you know, what happened to? So in this election, Naftali Bennett, who has been a major cabinet individual in government after government and has been, you know, had been a rising star at the same time of, as Yair Lapid, and all of a sudden it looked like that was the rave wave of the Israeli future. 
Naftali Bennett's party with Ayala Chaket, another rising star, and Carolyn Glick, who is, I don't know what she means to Israelis, to American Jews on the right. She is perhaps the most articulate voice they turn to. Bennett, Shaked, and Glick did not win one seat. Now, what's that say to you about Bennett in particular, and again, the general position of the Israeli people today? Um, let me temper that. Um, they did not, as you say, win one seat, but that's because the electoral threshold is set at 3.9. Yes, they did not. Uh, and, they, okay, but they were they not able to win enough like seats. Three point. 3.85. Does it matter? Within 1,400 votes. Of, does it of matter? This is Bennett right. we're talking about. He didn't get enough right. votes to get one seat in the Knesset. We, it turns out um, that the votes, who, the voters he did get, um, largely came at the expense of the Jewish Home Party, um, the party he led until he left. You know, I think two months ago to found you know the new right party, um, he ended up splitting the religious Zionist vote and not drawing in polls. He initially drew probably three or four seats from Likud, uh, but Netanyahu ran a campaign in the last few days. And if you follow the campaign statements from Bennett and Shaked in the last two days or three days before the election, they said this openly. They said Netanyahu is drinking our voters with a straw. And the reason he's drinking over his straw was that he was warning that if he doesn't, if Likud doesn't grow, you know, quickly, um, because it was currently smaller in the polls than Blue and White, uh, then in fact Blue and White would get first chance from the president to establish a coalition and would be able to do so. Um, and that was the entirety of the Likud campaign. And it was hammered in every... Netanyahu uh, famously once went 400 days without giving an interview to the Israeli press. It's not a man who is deeply enamored with the, the press. Uh, on, on, in the three days before Election Day, I think he gave two or three dozen interviews in a blitz, and that was the message. And so he, Netanyahu, um, shaped the last days of the campaign essentially to destroy um, the New Right Party, and also the Zahut Party next to it, uh, which also drew from sort of similar groups, from that right-wing um, uh, voter. So uh, that's what happened, um, and, and it's important to note that uh, they failed to make it in, and, and, it, and that's a disaster for them, but um, that doesn't mean they shouldn't try again. If you come within 14, there's something like a quarter million votes there. If you come within 1,400 votes of getting in, uh, you know, it's a failure in terms of your political capabilities going forward for the next Knesset. Um, it doesn't mean you don't try again, in my view. I understand. Um, it, uh, again, I, it says something dramatic to me. Listen, Chaviv, we saw the, the last Netanyahu coalition government fall for many reasons, but one of them had to do with the fact that there was a d divide inside the coalition as to how the Haredi Jews of Israel should be treated. Should they be drafted? Do we expect them to be part of the labor force? And ultimately, that division, as well as the Western Wall controversy, which again meant, means much more to American Jews than to Israeli Jews, but the controversy having to do with where, what Haredi participation in Israeli life would be was one of the things that brought down the last Netanyahu coalition government. As we sort of reach the end of this discussion, why should we think anything different is going to happen this time? Why isn't the recipe that we see being used to create this coalition government not going to wind up in the exact same place, Khaviv? I don't share. What you just described is the interpretation of many very, very smart observers of the last coalition, and indeed it fell early. But it did survive four years, and it fell only a few months early, um, and I believe largely because of questions of scheduling. Netanyahu looked at polls, and he preferred, uh, you know, if, if the government goes to election on time, then there's a six-month campaign. Traditionally in Israeli history, six-month camp, the longer the campaign goes, the worse that is for the incumbent. 
Um, and if the government falls early, then there's a three-month campaign. So Netanyahu wanted a shorter campaign and therefore needed to make the government fall earlier than, but, it, you know, but he did actually last four full years. So I, I don't think the last coalition collapsed. I think Netanyahu toppled it for reasons of campaign strategy. Um, and I also think that um, uh, this government going forward, because Netanyahu is so much bigger now, he has 35 seats. That is the most that a Likud uh, prime minister has received since Ariel Sharon in 2003. I think that uh, with a much larger faction, Netanyahu actually has to give the other coalition partners less and has to listen to them a little bit less. And their ability to threaten this coalition is a little bit reduced. So I actually suspect that uh, the arguments between the secularists, it used to be that you know, Israel Beitena was on one side with Jewish home on the Haredi question, and the two Haredi parties were on the other side. Uh, Jewish, um, Bennett is now gone. Israel Beitena is still a secularist Russian party and is still advancing and pushing you know, <clears throat> uh, the ultra-Orthodox draft and things like that. But I think that both they and the Haredim are, are weakened by Likud's uh, strength. So I suspect this is going to be a more stable coalition than the very last one. And I'm one of the people who argue that Netanyahu's last coalition was very, very stable. Okay. There are American Jews who argue the movement of Israel to the right, symbolized by Netanyahu is winning again and right-wing parties being the essence of the coalition, puts a greater strain on Israeli and American Jewish relations. 30 seconds, Kaviv. What's your message to American Jews? Israelis are responding to their experience. Israel has given up 85% of the territory it conquered in 1967. It pulled out of Gaza unilaterally. Elod Olmert in 2006 won an election promising to pull out of the West Bank and then had to enter a war in Gaza and a war in Lebanon, the two places from which he had withdrawn. Israelis are capable of withdrawing. But Israelis believe that they can't withdraw because every vacuum you create in this region is filled by bad guys. And that has been the experience of the Americans and of the Israelis. So if that's called right wing, that skepticism, that confusion, that frustration is called right wing, then you can call it right wing. I suggest that the gap between American Jews and Israeli Jews is not created by Israelis, it's not created by Americans, it's not created by politics whatsoever. It wasn't Obama Netanyahu that created it, and it's not Trump Netanyahu that created it. It's a deeper gap of the, in, in which we, we don't really share history. We don't share a hundred years of history. And that's what divides us. And we don't really understand each other. So I, I don't think it's creating tension between Israelis and American Jews, it's creating tension between American Jews and their desire to understand in Israel that they feel they no longer understand. I would argue that American Jews who worry about an Israeli right-wing shift, distancing Israel from them, are, are already very, very far from understanding Israel and, uh, and Israelis in a human way, in, in a real way, and therefore that's the gap that needs to be dealt with. There, the, the Israel they feel, they believe in, is, is essentially a cartoon and not the real Israel. And the more we get to know each other, the more we bridge that gap, regardless of politics. Beautifully said. You're, you, know, you know how wonderful I think you are. I, that's why I keep chasing you. You're the best in the world. Chavi Retegur, thank you for always thank being you. available. No, no, you, you just go from strength to strength. And I will chase you more about this. We're not done, but the clock has grabbed me. So I'll call you again in the thank very you. near future. We'll watch how this whole thing plays out. But I thank you so much, Khaviv, for being with us all yes, the time. Yes, we will. Thank you, my thank friend. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Khaviv Retegur, political columnist, analyst for the Times of Israel. My thanks to our director, Sloan, Colm, Sloan Copeland, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.